Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K-E-S-H-W-A-N-I, Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here. GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you're interested in watching the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now, we are in the process of redoing the problems, and we are on, prob we are on page number 190. Please turn to it. Problem page number 190. The very first problem that you see on the page number 190 is number 196. Right now, we can actually skip 196 because inadvertently I need to put it right if it's 197 on the blackboard, so I'm going to stick with it. I don't want to erase this thing. So let's do 197 first, and then once we finish 197, we'll go back and take care of 196. Here's what the problem says. In 197, they're looking for the greatest possible straight line distance, the greatest possible straight line distance in the rectangular box that is 5 by 10 by 10. That is 5 by 10 by 10. Now before we begin, begin, before we begin the solution and before we dive into this thing, there is one slight thing that I want to get out of my system. In the problem it says, I'm going to read it verbatim here, it's, I'm going to read to you verbatim. It says, what is the greatest possible straight line distance between two points on the box? on the box. I don't think they meant to say on the box. I think it should say, in my opinion, instead of on the box, the wrong preposition, it should, it should have said in the box. Now what I have here, what I'm going to show you here, it just so happens that I happen to be a proud owner of a rectangular box. I know that. I know you're jealous. Exactly. Here's a rectangular box that I happen to own. And when you say what's the greatest possible distance between any two points on the box, on the box, in my opinion, means on the face of the box. And the greatest possible distance between two points on the box, you would take the, a, a face with the two, two of the longer dimensions, and what we're looking for is the length of this diagonal here. The length of this diagonal on the face. So in our case, you will take a face which is 10 by 10, and you will be looking at the diagonal of that, uh, of that, rect uh, of that triangle, 10 by 10 by this diagonal right here. And that will be a very simple, straightforward problem. It wouldn't be a rectangular box if you're doing it on the box. It would be a two-dimensional problem with a simple right-angle triangle. What they're asking here is what is the greatest possible distance between two points in the box. So you open the box and you ask yourself, what is the longest stick? What is the longest stick that I can fit inside the box? Here is my box. And what is the longest possible stick that I can fit inside the box? So what we're going to do now is going to actually look at the box, we're going to put the box, we will put our rectangular box, we will put our three-dimensional box on the blackboard and we're going to ask ourselves what is the longest possible distance between the two points, how do we visualize it in the three dimensions. Let's take a look at it. Tell you what, I have, I have a better idea actually. Instead of doing this problem here, 5 by 10 by 10, let's do a different one here for a second. Let's do a different one, let's do 5 by 7 by 10. And once we, do, once we have done that one, once we get some practice, you can, we will go back into the original problem. So here's, we're going to draw our rectangular box. Now with the rectangular box, or with, with, with any three-dimensional object uh, that you can apply, you have to take your time, otherwise it doesn't come out very nice. So I'm going to, I'm going to shut up and, and concentrate. It looks like my box here. There is the box. There is our box 2 by 7 by 10. It really doesn't matter where you it really doesn't matter where you put the three dimensions, the answer will always be the same. And if you don't if you don't trust me, you can try the other uh, the other two way yourself. I put a two here and seven here, you can try putting ten down here and seven down there. You'll see that the greatest possible distance is always going to be the same. The greatest possible distance is always going to be the same no matter how you set it up. Why is the greatest possible distance that you can find always going to be the same? Because it's the same, because it's the same bloody box. It's the same bloody box, whether I look at it this way, or whether I look at it that way, or whether I look at it this way, the greatest, the longest possible stick that I can fit in it, is going to be the longest possible stick that I can fit in it. It doesn't matter how, 
which vantage point you look uh, look at it from. Do you understand? It doesn't matter which perspective you take. What's your vantage point? The longest stick that you can fit in there will always be the same. Anyway, the the longest possible distance that we can find between between any two points here is uh, is this one from this point all the way to that point. This one. Now, before we can find that distance, let's call it A to B. The triangle that we're going to be dealing with is this triangle right here. Now before we can find before we can find that distance, before we can worry about the distance A to B, we first have to know what A to C is. A to C is the floor diagonal. A to C A to C is the floor diagonal. It is not the it is not the it's not the diagonal that sticks in the air, it's the floor diagonal. Let's find it, shall we? So let's look at the triangle. We have A, B, C, let's call this thing D. Let's look at triangle A, C, D. Let's look at triangle A, C, D. Right here. A, C, and D. D is right here. A to D is 7. C to D is same as this guy, which is 10. And this is what we're looking for. Let's find this first. The floor diagonal that we're talking about right here, A to C. That's the floor diagonal, which, which we are calling x. x squared from this triangle would equal 10 squared plus 7 squared, which is 149, and therefore x is equal to root of 149. So that part is done. The floor diagonal is square root of 149, square root of 149. So now we can look at, now we are ready, now we are ready to do the job actually that we have to do. It's not a complicated problem, it's just you have to visualize this, that's what gives people some time trouble. But other than that, it's a quite straightforward problem because all we are doing here is all we have here is a simple application of Pythagorean theorem twice. We're going to apply the Pythagorean theorem on two different triangles, both of which happen to be right angle triangle. This is a right angle triangle right here because this is a right angle right here. This 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 point right here is a right angle. And similarly, now we're going to look at ABC. Let's look at triangle ABC. Where can we put triangle ABC? Let's put it here. There is A, there is our B, and there is our C. B to C is same as this guy, 2, that's your 2, B to C. A to C, we already found it, A to C is right here, square root of 149. Now we can find out A to B very quickly, very easily rather. Let's call it Y, because we already used up X for the other one, so let's call it Y. So now we apply the Pythagorean theorem one more time. So it's going to be Y squared, Y squared is equal to the square of 2 plus the square of this quantity, the square of 100, the square of the square root of 149, which is 4 plus 149, which is going to give us 153. Our y is the square root of 153. Our y is going to be the square root of 153. Now, you can leave it like this if you want. You can leave it like this or you can simplify it a little bit if you like. I can, uh, we, 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 you should notice right away, if you didn't notice it, you should have noticed that 1 plus 5 is 6, which is divisible by, 6 is divisible by 3, the sum of these two digits is divisible by 3, and 3 of course is divisible by 3. So 153 is divisible by 3. Let's see what happens. 153 is divisible by 3, so we're going to divide it, because 1 plus 5 one more time is 6, and 6 is divisible by 3, and 3 is divisible by 3. Or if you like, 9 is divisible by 3. How many 3's in a 15? 15 has 5 3's. And 15 has 5 threes, and of course 3 has 1 threes. So we get 51 one more time. We, we get 51 again. Uh, we get 51, which is what we get. A, one, what I meant to say is that we get a number one more time, which is again divisible by 3, because 5 plus 1 is 6. Let's divide 51 by, let's divide 51 by 3 again. And we get how many threes in a 5? 5 has 1 threes. 5 has 1 3. The remaining 2 goes and joins the 2 becomes 21. And 21 has 7 threes. So it looks to me that 153 is simply 9 times 9 times 17, which of course can be written as 3 root 17. 3 root 17. Now the question is, 
question is, do we, did we really have to do all this work here? Or why couldn't we just leave it the way it was? Why couldn't we just, why couldn't we have left it as square root of 153? Well, the reason is, that the answer to that question is that we have to do this transition because in the exam, the answer choices are not going to be listed as square root of 153. Answer choices are list, going to be listed in this form. They're going to simplify it, so we have to know how to make the transition. So one more time, 153, okay? Now, I just realized, a, a split second ago, I realized that I actually made it a little bit more complicated than it had to be. I'm going to do it one more time. Pay attention. 1 plus 5 is 6. 6 plus 3 is 9. Had I not been lazy and had I actually done, added the last digit, I would have realized that it adds up to 9. And 9, of course, is divisible by 9. As long as the sum of the digits is divisible by 3, then the number itself is divisible by 3. As long as the sum of the digits, 1 plus 5 is 6, 6 plus 3 is 9, as long as the sum of the digits is divisible by 3, the number itself is divisible by 3. But also, but also, if the sum of the digits is divisible by 9, then the number itself is divisible by 9. We could have, instead of doing it in two steps, we could have very easily, quite readily, had divided 153 by 9 in one shot. Let's do it very quickly. 153, we're going to divide it by 9 in one shot. How many nines? How many nines in a one? One has no nines. That one goes and joins the five, becomes fifteen. How many nines in a fifteen? Fifteen has one nine. Fifteen has one nine. Fifteen has one nine, that's a one. Once you take away the nine from the fifteen, we are left with six. That six goes and joins the three, becomes sixty-three. How many nines in a sixty-three? Sixty-three has seven nines. Seven nines are sixty-three. Well, we got our 17 just like before in one step instead of having to do in two steps. But anyway, that's the point here. Do you understand? Very good. Let's do the problem that appears in the book. Tell you what, I, I, I want, I'm going to give you a little bit more information if you're interested. Revise, revise GRE math. I know that you're not here for the GRE. I am quite cognizant of the fact that you are here for GMAT. But math is math. Math does not change. Do you understand? Just type in revised GRE math. Type in day, day 373 and day 374. Watch these two videos. Watch these two videos. Just put in, type in this tag, revised GRE math, day 373 and day 374. Watch those two videos and you might find it fruitful. You might, uh, you might learn something from it. You might find it useful. Anyway, we are done with all those testing. I need my break so I can, before I erase everything. That's what it is. Once you understand the procedure, it's very straightforward. Once we understand the procedure, it's quite straightforward. Let's do one more, shall we? Let's do one more. Why not? Let's do one more. Instead of 2 by 7 by 10, Let's do another one, not, not the one in the book, but another one. How about, how about 8 by 9 by 12? 8 by 9 by 12. 8 by 9 by 12. So let's erase all of this thing. And this one is going to go very fast. We have 8 by 9 by 12. 8 by 9 by 12. So here's our triangle. Here's our triangle. Here's our triangle A, C, D. A to D. A to D is 9 right here. Well, it's just a fluke that it happens to be. Oh, not, not a fluke. We just, I just put it there. A to D is 9. There is your 9. C to D is 10. Let's put it there, 10. C to D is 10. And what we are interested in, or rather, C to D is not 10, that's 12, the way, the way we set it up. There is no 10 as a matter of fact, what the hell? I was looking at this 10, this 10 needs to be changed to 12. And there you go. Oh, that's actually very simple. This one actually is very simple. Are you able to see immediately that this is actually very simple because it's a 3, 4, 5 triangle incognito. It's a 3, 4, 5 triangle. Incognito, in disguise. It's a 3, 4, 5 triangle. We don't have to do anything at all. This 9 is same as 3 times 3. 12 is same as 4 times 3. And therefore, this x is going to be 5 times 3, which is 15. It is just 5 times 3. 3 times 3, 4 times 3, 5 times 3. So that's 15. That part is done. 
the floor diagonal A to C is 15. That was very simple. Now we do the other part. Now we do A, B, C. A, B, C. B to C is same as this guy. 8, right here. Uh, A to C we just found out is 15. And the question is how much is this guy? Let's call it Y again, just for consistency. Let's call it Y again. And I don't get confused by these two 8's sitting next to each other. This is the 8, which is this guy right here. So again, a simple application of Pythagorean theorem will see us through. Y squared is equal to 64 plus uh, 15 squared, which is 225. Or if you think this is 8 squared plus 15 squared. And I hope, you, I hope that you know your squares by heart. You have to know your squares by heart. 1 through 20 as I always remind you. Do you understand? Some, some basic facts in math, they come in quite handy in the exam. It saves you time. So 15 squared is 225, 8 squared is 64, we get a 9, we get an 8, and we get 289. What do you suppose we're going to do with 289? I know 16 squared, I know 16 squared is 256. That I do know for, that, that I do know by heart. And I just gave you the sermon that you should know your squares by heart, 1 through 20. Well, I myself also do not know 17, 18, and 19 by heart. I don't. I do know up to 16. Up to 16, I know my squares. 16 is 256, and seven, 17 squared, my feeling is that it's going to do the job. It's going to do the job because 7 times 7 is 49. It matches the unit digit here. Obviously, it's not 18 times 18, because 18 times 18, 8 is 64. <coughs> 18 times 18 will end in a 4. This ends in a 9. That tells me that we should try 17. Let's try 17. 7, 7 is a 49. Carry 4. 7, 1 is a 7, plus 4 is 11. Times 1. And we get 17. We get 9, 8, and 2. What do you know? So the answer is, the answer is, the the, the greatest possible straight line distance that can fit in the rectangular box 8 by 9 by 7, 9 by 12, A to B, A to B, we just found out is 17. Let's erase this part, we don't need this thing. A to B, we just found out is 17. Do you understand? Now let's do the one in the book, shall we? Let's do the problem in the book. Give me a break. Tell you what. Let's first take care of let's first take care of uh, problem number 196. And I want you to try I want you to try 197 on your own. And once you have done the work on your own, once you have found the solution on your own, then you can compare the work that we'll do together later on. But right now I want to take care of 196 before I forget it. In 196, we have 20 integers that were randomly selected, were randomly selected from consecutive integers negative 10 to positive 10. So from negative 10 to positive 10, we have, we're going to select 20 integers. How many, how many integers are there from negative 10 to positive 10, by the way? From negative 10 to positive 10, no, we do not have 20 integers. From negative 10 to positive 10, we have 21 integers. Don't forget the zero in the middle. There are 21 integers. And from those 21 integers, we're going to choose 20 of them at random. We are told that we are allowed to have repetition. We are allowed to have repetition. In other words, it is quite possible that we can end up picking the same integers three times or four times or even 20 times if you want. The question is, what is the least possible value of the product of these 20 integers? Now, remember, we want the least possible product, the least possible product. And because of the fact that they're looking for least possible value of the product of these 20 integers that we're going to pick at random, 
immediately people tend to think that, well, if you want the least, why not make all of them negative 20? If you pick negative 20, 20 negative 10 rather, not negative 20, it goes from negative 10, 10, negative 10 to negative positive, 20, positive 10. If you pick negative 10, negative, if you pick negative 10 20 times, which is not very likely, highly unlikely that you pick 20 integers uh, 20, on 20 different occasions, you pick 20 integer, uh, one integer uh, each time to, on 20 different occasions out of the 21 integers from negative 10 to positive 10. Highly unlikely that all of these 20 occasions you will end up picking negative 10. But it is not impossible. So it is possible. What is the least possible value? So some people might say, well, if you pick negative 10 20 times, the negative 10 times negative 10 times negative 10 times negative 10, negative 10 multiplied by itself 20 times will give us negative 10 raised to 20. Negative 10 raised to 20, people might feel that that's the, the least possible value. And that's answer choice A. Is that true? Is that the least possible value? The answer is no. The answer is no. Answer is a, answer is a resounding no. Because negative number, a negative 10, a negative number being raised to a, an even power will become positive. This quantity is same as 10 raised to positive, 10 raised to 20 which is not the least, this is the maximum. This is the maximum. The answer choice A shows us the quantity which is the maximum possible product of these 20 integers picked at random from negative 10 to positive 10. Our job is to pick the integers in such a fashion that their product happens to be the least possible value. Why don't we try negative 10? Why don't we try negative 10? Why don't we try negative 10 19 times? Let's pick 19 of them as negative 10 and then have a 0. On the 20th occasion we pick a 0, then of course the product is going to be 0, which of course is far lower than 10 raised to 20. But the question is, is that the lowest possible that we can go or can we go even lower? The answer is yes, we can make the product even lower by picking again negative 10 on 19 different occasions, but on the 20th occasion we pick 1. If you pick 1, now instead of 0, the product is going to be negative 10 raised to 19. A negative 10 raised to 19 is a, is a very huge negative number, which is much smaller than 0. Is that the smallest that we can go? Is that the, is that the least possible value of the product of the 20 integers? The answer again is no. Why stop at 1? Why not have our 20th integer as a 2? In which case, this is going to be twice as much. I'm going to raise this part. We don't need any of this thing anymore. One more time, don't forget to watch it. Day number 373 and 374. What does word incognito mean? It's a very simple word. Of course, you know it, incognito. But in the event that you happen to be a non-native speaker, as I happen to be one, and if you don't know what incognito means, and if you need to learn it, we learn this word incognito. I know that in our vocabulary lessons. On day number 42. Day 42. If you're interested in improving your vocabulary, just type in GMAT vocabulary words, GMAT vocabulary words, day 20, and the video will pop right up. Watch that video. In that video, we learn the word incognito. You will also learn some other useful and good words. Do you understand? Back to our work. Is that the smallest possible value that we can find of the product of these 20 integers? The answer is no. Why stop at 2? Why not go to 3? Why not go to 3? Oh, what the hell? Let's go the whole hog. Let's go, let's go all the way. Let's, let's have the whole heart. Why, why stop at 3? Why not go all the way up to 10? Now, if you pick negative, nine, negative 10 nine, on 19 different occasions, and on the 20th occasion, if you pick 10, what will end up is this product. The question is, no, the problem is, none of the answer choices actually look like that. We're going to have to do something with it. This does not appear in the answer choices. We're going to have to do something with it. We're going to do that on the top. Let's do this on the top, okay, so that it's easier to see. So what we have here is negative 10 raised to 19 times 10. Now, negative 10 raised to 19, of course, is a negative number. Negative 10 raised to 19 is same as negative 10 raised to 19. This thing, negative is going to remain negative, this is going to come out, and this is going to be 10 raised to negative 19. Are you able to see that? Because this negative is not going to go away because of the fact that we are multiple, because of the fact that the exponent is an odd number, negative 10 raised to 19, it's going to be a negative number, it's a very huge negative number, 
and that is, that is going to be negative. This is same as negative times 10 raised to 19. Right there. Negative times 10 raised to 19. Times 20. So now we have 10 raised to 19 times 10, which is same as 10 raised to 1. So what we end up is negative times 10 raised to 19 plus a 1, which of course is negative negative 10 raised to 20. And one of the answer choices will, meet, will match this form. And that's answer choice E. This is answer, the correct answer to this problem is answer choice E. Listen, my intention actually was to do the problem, problem number 197, but I'm not going to do it now. The video has already become very long. We'll do 197 tomorrow, okay? When, now, when I say tomorrow, tomorrow means day number 357. 356, we're going to do data sufficiency. Do you understand? I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.